There's not much more to say than Jonathan. Tell us about Coke Moss. Hey everyone. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about code mods, and you'll notice that my talk is titled Transformers uh, in Disguise. Um, I only mentioned Transformers once in the talk, so I hope that you weren't here for, uh, you know, giant robots smashing other giant robots. Uh, um, so who am I? Uh, you can find me uh, at all of these places. Uh, my name is Jonathan Jackson. I work at 201 Created, which Corey was just talking about, and I actually have a slide he could have used to give you some contact information, and we'll go, go there in a second. Um, I've run uh, this podcast for a number of years uh, called Ember Weekend. Has anyone heard of it? Yay! Cool. All right. Sweet. Um, and uh, you can find me in some underscore SC or dash SC. There's probably a regex that could be made to describe it, but um, I have not endeavored. <laughs> Uh, okay, so if you want to reach out to me, reach out to me there. I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and, and as Corey mentioned, I work for a company called 2-1 Created. Um, reach out to us at these two places if you'd like, uh, and we'd love to work with you. Obviously, we're big fans of Ember. Uh, I've had a great experience working with, uh, with uh, both the people at 2-1 Created and also our clients, so I'm definitely eager. If you want to reach out and talk to me, let me know. Okay, so I want to start off and ask a question, and I'm again going to kind of do one of these to see. Um, who here has written a code mod? Okay, that's a, that's a good number. That's not a small number. Um, so by the end of this talk, if you want to, uh, you can write a code mod along with me. So by the end of this talk, you can answer yes in the affirmative to this question. Um, and normally when I do a talk, I like to start off with like a roadmap to kind of, you know, just give you a, a sense of how long is this guy going to keep talking. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't really play well with this because I'm actually going to tell you uh, a story. Um, so it's story time, and we're going to meet our hero. So our hero, uh, I'm going to be using kind of a narrative device called an allegory. Uh, I'm going to be referring to things in really broad, sweeping, by sweeping names. So this is just our hero, uh, not, not a name, just a hero. Uh, she's an emoji. Um, she's a long-term feature developer. Uh, with about two years of feature work under her belt. Um, and I guess we should talk about what kind of feature work that means. Uh, first off, who knows uh, what kind of a feature developer is, generally? Kind of not like library development, but more day-to-day, -day, a client comes in with, a, uh, with a, desire, a desired goal or a feature set saying, hey, we need this button to turn green when you click this other button or whatever. Uh, and you're designed, you're tasked with making that true uh, and then, I mean, in a deal world, you're also responsible for um, ensuring that that is true, like with tests and other, other devices, and uh, then you're usually tasked with long-term maintenance of that, or some sort of long-term plan for it. So uh, I guess a feature developer is more of a corporate-y kind of term to describe the kind of work we're doing. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a theme park that I, I think it's like the first or second Google image when you search for like theme park. Um, but I thought it was actually really good to like see this and kind of look at how uh, how code bases kind of can be theme parks at times. Um, you can see we have different rides and we have different concerns, uh, different teams. Likely this is too big to be you know like the people working on the flume ride are not going to be working uh, the snack uh, the snack carts. Uh, so it, it's just it's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of independent systems that have to work neatly together uh, and. Ideally, in an ideal code base, there's a lot of uh, shared libraries and shared solutions and hopefully patterns and, and other things that kind of help teams to share work and leverage one another uh, to make a product better and cohesive. Uh, so yeah, so this is kind of the code base that our hero works in. Um, and, and a couple of things that are really important is that features are, are not features. The work on this code base is never finished and it is increasing like complex. Uh, it's only going to increase and balloon in size. We're not going to remove rides from this theme park. That is, uh, unless there's like, I guess a, an accident or something. I don't know why you would ever change a theme park. Uh, but we're only going to add to this. We're going to add new rides. We're going to add new attractions. Um, ideally, we'll add new snacks because that's why you go to a theme park anyways. And beer. <clears throat> okay. So our hero is working, as she does, on this code base and notices there's a problem. And the problem is in this Wi-Fi unit. Um, and you'll notice even from, you'll, you'll notice in a second uh, that the Wi-Fi is a shared module. It's used everywhere across the code base, across the theme park. We see it constantly. 
Uh, and, and she finds out that it's really inefficient and it's causing a lot of developer pain. The ergonomics aren't there. So, you know, being a, being a, a, a go-getter, uh, uh, trying to do, go above and beyond, our hero decides to rewrite this function and kind of create a good function. And once again, this is allegory, so yes, we are going to be working on a code mod to change a, a function named bad function to a function named good function. So yeah, bear with me though. Um, and you'll notice, once again, uh, it's used in multiple aspects of the park, of the theme park. So you'll see that it's here in the, in the entrance, it's also here in the, uh, the probably information kiosk section, uh, it's scattered throughout the entire place, and it's really inefficient, it's causing developers like backlogs and, and sort of things like that. And, uh, and it looks like this. And I, I guess maybe uh, I can actually open it up. Just shout it out. What do you think a bad function might do that would be bad? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, yeah. Um, it, could, it could do uh, a lot of things. It can make a long network request. It could do long polling and not really take care of its cleanup. It could uh, do any number of things. Um, I think in this case, I'm specifically gonna be talking about the, uh, the signature of the method, so the way that it's invoked, but it could be any number of reasons why you might wanna introduce it in a different way, uh, move away from a mix-in, and instead go to a more declarative syntax with like a creating of a class or something like that. You can imagine a bunch of different reasons why you might wanna change bad function to good function. So uh, some of the, uh, the p possible pitfalls here would be like optional arguments or uh, uh, ar arguments that are parsed differently depending on invocation. Uh, yeah, and, and once again, this bad function, just to reiterate, is shared amongst many places and we need to fix it. So uh, for the terms, uh, for the purposes of simplification, we're going to say that the bad function can be invoked in these two fashions. Um, it can be invoked uh, with a callback, which is pretty standard, um, and then it can be invoked passing in an object and a string, and then uh, we can assume that this string uh, is then called on the object. So thing must have a function called success, otherwise bad function throws. Um, and our hero goes back to her team and says, hey, there's a problem with this bad function. We are experiencing like all of these problems, developer ergonomics, the speed at which we can develop is negatively impacted, uh, the performance of our website is negatively impacted, occasionally it drops the database, you know, it's whatever. <clears throat> and then she proposes to her colleagues, hey, I have a fix. Uh, I've rewritten bad function to good function. And this is what it looks like. Good function, the first one, uh, and this is uh, for the purposes of, uh, uh, of this talk is kind of simple. The, it, it still accepts a callback, um, and that's kind of to show some basic things about, yeah, we'll see in a minute, about how regexes are kind of a failed solution. Uh, and then the following one, instead of doing what it was doing before, which is kind of implicitly taking that string and calling it on the object passed into it, uh, you wrap that in an arrow function and uh, call it manually from within its body. Um, and then she explains to her colleague, colleagues that it's used everywhere. So we really need to refactor this and it's going to involve a big effort. There's gonna be a lot of changes that need to take place, a lot of areas of the code base that are going to be touched and developers are going to have to halt or they're gonna be negatively impacted by, uh, by, by nasty merge, merge requests or uh, yeah, it's just gonna be, I mean, you've, you've dealt with Git conflicts before. It's, it's gonna be not fun. Okay, so uh, her colleagues kind of go back and, uh, and I'm gonna step out of the narrative, out of the story for a second. And, uh, and I asked, uh, a few months back now, um, I asked Twitter for some help to kind of talk about what are the excuses that a team like that presented with this similar problem might say that we don't have time for this refactor or or what, what would prevent this refactor? And an example that I have is uh, we're booked for the next five sprints on feature work, so I'm sorry, we can't do it. Or we don't have time to clean up because uh, as you know, especially on complex code bases, there's often deadlines that are outside of your control, outside of your manager's control, and then you have to go about three or four levels up before it's in someone's control, and that's not tenable. Uh, so uh, anyone wanna shout out some other reasons they've uh, not done a refactor? Anybody? Fear, that's a good one, yeah. FUD, that's a, certainly a thing, fear, uncertainty, doubt, that is very common. Um, so, say again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, so I, like I said, I asked Twitter, and here's some of the, uh, here's some of the responses. Uh, there's no time to refactor, we're rowing out a feature. <laughs> um, Taras uh, brought up uh, this one, which is, uh, why touch it if it's already working? 
there is that's fear again, but uh, I think that that is a thing that we've all experienced for sure. Uh, Melanie, who is going to speak, be speaking here, uh, brought up several actually. Uh, you know, it's not uh, it's not breaking our user experience. Uh, it, did demand did management demand this? Uh, frequently, especially in this case, in the case of our story, our protagonist, our hero, uh, found the solution herself. So how do you make that a priority to develop when it didn't come from management, didn't come from a, de a demand from users? Um, okay, so undaunted, our hero continues. She realizes that there are going to be pitfalls and problems, and the only way to, to advance is to, uh, is to try to come up with solutions. So. Um, you know, being a feature developer, uh, one of the things, if you ask a few of your colleagues uh, on how to maybe approach this, you're probably going to run into um, uh, the solution is going to be regex. Uh, who here has had problems with regexes in the past? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's pretty much everybody here, just to be clear. Um, and we're going to be talking about a talk from uh, Christoph Nakasawa in a second, because he does a great job of explaining uh, the next piece. But uh, one of the examples that he gives in his talk is talking about how uh, moving something like a mix-in uh, to a more declarative syntax, it, it causes challenge for, uh, for regex solutions. So, <clears throat> so our hero finds a regex solution, solution. She finds something that takes the string good, good function and turns it into, or bad function and turns it into good function. Um, and it fails to handle all cases and she's frustrated. So, uh, <clears throat> so in this case, uh, we have a couple of, uh, examples of just how it might not do all the things correctly. Um, for instance, in this case, it handles the callback function, but it does, uh, it just replaces the string for the, the second function. Um, so we can also think about other things. What about the arrow function in this case? Uh, what if uh, bad function is, is aliased, and, and we are, when we invoke it, we're not calling bad function the literal string, we're invoking whatever it was aliased to. Um, Dealing with new lines, new lines can be can happen in weird ways, different characters, encodings, etc. And I'm reminded of this XKCD from a million years ago. Which is accurate. <laughs> um, okay, so then uh, this was once again a few months ago. Uh, I asked the uh, New York crowd, my, my friends on Twitter, uh, were able to uh, answer this question as well. So um, what, what are the problems that you might experience with regexes? Uh, and I was pointed to by Ryan Toronto, who is not here, uh, this, uh, this Stack Overflow comment uh, that discusses um, HTML. So uh, the, the, the original poster uh, asks, how could, I, how could I do this? How could I you know, modify this side but not this side in a regex? And uh, the first comment uh, says this. It says, regular expressions are a tool that is insufficiently sophisticated to understand the construct, uh, constructs employed by HTML. Uh, since HTML is not a regular lang language, it can't be parsed by regular expressions. Um, and I think that's really true. That's something that is going to come back up when we start talking about JavaScript. Uh, the rest of that comment is here. I'll give you a second to read that. <laughs> This is a good one. I like legitimately laughed out loud at this one. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> all right. There's, there's, this is really good. We could keep. We could read all of it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and the same is true for JavaScript. Um, so basically, regular expressions are not going to be sufficiently uh, like so they're not going to be a sufficient solution for us to use them and, and really rely on them uh, to make modifications to JavaScript. So she goes back to her colleagues, and her colleagues tell her, uh, we'll come back to next sprint, which is code in most enterprises for we're not going to do this. <laughs> so our hero uh, goes back to uh, feature work. Um, and occasionally, over time, over the course of the next few months, she realizes that uh, she is persistently running into the performance problems or the whatever problems were spawned by uh, bad functions. So on, on Things like developer ergonomics or the ability to easily develop, um, she has to write down extra instructions on how to invoke bad function uh, because it's inconsistent. Um, she notices there are slowdowns when using the library uh, that it uses. Um, rebuilds and CI times, these are things that you would see could be a problem. Uh, and she just notes them and is really kind of sad because she's not going to be able to allocate the time necessary to fix it. 
So she goes to a meetup, and this is the only slide with uh, Transformers, so if you like robots, now's your time to take a picture. Um, and uh, the meetup is about uh, JS code shift. Uh, so uh, last talk, Tobias mentioned the uh, abstract syntax trees. We're going to be talking about that. Um, but he was referring to the Glimmer uh, syntax parser, um, which is not what we're going to be talking about here. We're actually going to be talking about a different tool set, and it's meant to work on JavaScript, not in the template land. Uh, and I, and I want to uh, mention uh, Krzysztof Nakasawa's talk uh, because I'm kind of stealing a certain section of this because I couldn't find a better way to explain it than to kind of reiterate some of the things. Um, JS Code Shift is uh, a set or a set of libraries that Facebook put together to um, allow you to easily do all this stuff. Um, so it's responsible for a few things, uh, and I'm going to write them out on the next slide. Uh, it's responsible for parsing, uh, finding, creating, and updating. Uh, nodes and then reprinting it back to an AST. So you're kind of going full circle from an AST back to an AST, uh, and it's allowing you to do transitions in the middle. So it looks kind of like this. Um, but each one of these little boxes is kind of a different uh, sub-library. So you, it, it took me a long time personally to kind of wrap my head around what, what is what, because the API for JS Code Shift is a little limiting. Um, so frequently you have to go to the actual code to understand how you should invoke something. Um, but don't let that in, don't, don't don't let that daunt you. It's uh, it's quite simple with the tool that uh, we're going to be talking about and using uh, that Tobias mentioned, AST Explorer. Um, so the parsing thing, the default parser from JS Code Shift is Babel parser, and in the next slide uh, you're going to be confused because uh, it switches over to a Sprema, um, and I say that because in AST Explorer the Babel parser uh, won't do one thing. There's a bug. So we'll be using the Esprima parser, but the Babel parser and the Esprima parser both are uh, compatible with the same uh, like abstract syntax definition from Mozilla. There's an actual like document that describes how it should behave and what what different aspects of JavaScript language need to be represented as in an AST. Um, and they're all they're almost all uh, of the of the popular JS parsers are compatible with this spec. So here's Esprima. Um, and, then, uh, and then the find, create, and update, I'm kind of like hand-waving a little bit of this because uh, it's not really super important, but uh, there is a, uh, a sub-library called uh, AST types from uh, uh, Ben Newman, and I believe he was also a Facebook engineer when, uh, when, this, when he wrote this. And, uh, and it's a Sprema compatible AST type hierarchy, so you can define types uh, and then you can reference them, and, and it uses uh, the, the aforementioned AST uh, standard. I mentioned. Um, and it kind of turns an, a given input of JavaScript into nodes, and nodes are really just a simple object uh, that you can use. I mean, you're, you're probably very fam familiar. It's an object literal. It has a very specified standard uh, notation. It has location information, which I actually never really thought about specifically why you might want to use that, but then uh, the last talk, Tobias gives a great example of why you might want to use that. Um, and uh, and it, it gives you just the raw thing. Um, and then uh, it also has a concept of, uh, of paths. I think this might be the path, this is why it's kind of hand wavy. I think the path is actually kind of given to you by uh, the code shift kind of library wrapper rather than, because the node is the AST type. Um, and the path contains meta information, uh, including the node itself uh, for a given path. So say you're on an expression, uh, you'll get the node, which is the object literal, um, and then you'll have the path's parent node. Uh, or sorry, the path.parent, I believe, returns uh, another path, like the parent path. So you'd have its node and its meta information and so on. Um, and, and it's just a wrapping. So I'm going to be referring to nodes and paths kind of interchangeably, but they're not really interchangeably. The path is just wrapping the other one. So uh, if, I, if I do that, please forgive me and just remember this slide. Uh, so once again, hand wave, hand wave. I actually wish I had a cool Tom Dale style, you know, animation, hand wave, you know. Uh, but you know, there's only so much time in the day. Not everyone can be as cool as you, Tom, sorry. Uh, and then uh, the, the last piece is from this library called Recast. Uh, so one of the really annoying things, or one of the, the problems that would happen is you, you would think that since I'm using Babel to parse, I should be able to use Babel to compile and, and output a, a, a template given an AST. Uh, and you could do that, but Babel outputs to syntax that is ugly. 
It's not what you originally wrote. If I write a, a, a code mod and even lines that I don't change were to get rewritten, uh, I'd have a lot of people that were very angry at me very quickly. Uh, so what Recast does is it's quite smart and sophisticated in that it will only rewrite the portions of code that you modify when you do your pass. Um, and it's, it's pretty smart, it's, uh, it does a lot of cool things. And all of these options uh, here, uh, Esprima and Recast and, uh, and the access to the AST types and stuff is all available um, in uh, the, the AST Explorer. So you can just drop down a few drop downs and you can start uh, fooling around with the AST right now. And I, I think that's the best way to start exploring these things is literally just go to that site, start looking at ASTs and just play around with it. There's a lot of things you can do. As we saw in the previous talk, it's not limited to JavaScript, but I think JavaScript's like, there's a lot of immediate implications um, for like even, even basic refactors of your code. Um, and yeah, and it's important to, to, to note that we're talking about uh, AST to AST uh, transforms. So the parser gives us an AST that we can work with, uh, JS code shift lets us manipulate it, and then uh, recast allows us to print it back out in a method that doesn't rewrite the whole world. Uh, yeah, so okay, so with that knowledge, our hero, we're gonna jump back in the story now. Uh, with that knowledge, our hero uh, tries again. And, uh, and once again, uh, we're uh, gonna be using this tool. Uh, it's called AST Explorer, and I am going to do some live coding. Uh, maybe. I have, I have backups if I fail at live coding. Uh, but uh, we're gonna try to write the, uh, the code shift together using this tool. Um, so uh, in between the, the presentations, there was a Wi-Fi password. Um, does anyone know what it is off the top of their head? Yeah, okay, so if you don't know it, you should find it and follow this link if you'd like to follow along. All right, so, um, okay, so a couple things I wanna walk through uh, before we start is uh, because uh, we're using recast, uh, the link that I have I think should automatically select this, but uh, it does default to Babylon, one of the Babylons, uh, I believe, or maybe, you know, something else. Uh, but you should switch it to Esprima, otherwise you won't be able to follow along with, uh, if you click a thing, it will actually highlight in the AST where that thing exists. So in this case, we're gonna be working with this call expression right here. Um, and it's, it's an expression statement because it has a, you know, the semicolon or whatever, but, but the thing we actually care about is this part, which is the call expression. Um, and uh, we want this to kind of look like this, the commented node. And I have the commented node out there because we're actually going to have to construct that. Um, that's kind of for extra credit, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, the bottom pane, bottom left pane shows us the transformer. This is the thing that we are expected to pass to, um, uh, to we have to export this function and it will be used by JS Code Shift to actually perform the transformation. Uh, and, uh, and it has uh, a couple things that it gives. It, it gives you, it gives you the file, um, which we are going to uh, parse with J, which is the API for JS Code Shift. Um, you won't really have to know that. This kind of, uh, this build up here on the, on the bottom left pane, if you start a brand new AST Explorer, you'll see that. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we have a couple of things that we need to do. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to find the, the call expression that we're looking for. So uh, unsurprisingly, we have uh, find uh, function on the return from the parsing of the file. Uh, and that allows us to do find things, and you can see that we already have some type information about like what we need to type into the next thing. So the AST Explorer actually provides like hints for like what are the arguments that this expects. In this case, it's expecting a type definition and a filter, and the filter is optional. You can see that right here. Can you see my cursor? Okay, cool. Uh, and we're going to use AST types, so, um, so J is the, the, the code shift API, um, but it also has type different definitions on it, and we're going to use the capital C call expression. Um, and I'm just going to prove that this works. I'm going to dot off and remove it. And we can see that all of our stuff gets removed. Um, so that just proves that we actually have, we're actually filtering correctly. Um, when I add a filter, um, it's, it's basically like a kind of a simplistic pattern matching, and we're going to be filtering the callee. Oh, I'm sorry, I should actually show you this first. Um, so here's the thing we actually care about, this callee inside of the call expression. So here's our call expression. It has a, a, a property called callee. That callee has a property of name and the name contains the thing that we actually care about. So we're gonna filter on that name and bad function like that. Um, we're still removing, but you can see it's removing correctly. 
Uh, so that just works, uh, which is cool. Uh, I'm going to remove this uh, remove function, and we get back to where we were at before. Um, and uh, we have uh, so now that we have we've restricted the remove or the the, the find to only return nodes that we actually care about, only bad function exp uh, call expressions. Uh, we can run the function for each, and that's just going to do exactly what it kind of says in the 10. We're going to loop over each of the paths. So find returns a collection of paths, uh, and we're going to call for each, and then we're going to call this path. Okay, so now we have a path that we can do stuff by default. It just doesn't do anything. Um, we're going to, uh, so there's actually a replace function as well, and the replace function would allow you to take a whole new node and replace it, but we're actually going to mutate the path, so the for each kind of doesn't do anything if you don't do anything in it, but uh, yeah. So, uh, so remember, we, we search for callie.name.bad function, or, or that object, so we can actually just mutate it. So uh, path is a wrapper, so we're going to be mutating the node that the wrapper wraps, so we gotta call path.node first, then call e, then name, and we're gonna say, that should equal good function. And we can already see that we're ahead of the game with the, uh, we're, we're in parity with what the regex does by default. So that's kind of a code mod. It's not a very fully fledged one, but that's part of a code mod. Um, so that handles the first case where it's just a callback. So we're just saying, hey, I'm just gonna rename the callee. Um, and that's it, the callee identifier. Um, but now if we are going to, we're gonna get a little bit more complicated and there's gonna be a little scary section, um, but bear with me. Um, okay, so we care about the arguments. So in this, in this, in the case that we're already covering, the argument's length is, is, is one. So if, we're, if our argument's length is greater than one, we're gonna do something different. And remember, we're mutating. So since the mutation happens outside the node, we're still doing the same thing. So I'm gonna do some stuff just to make this a little easier to read. Um, we're gonna let property name equal path.node.arguments1.value. And since, uh, if you call value on this, it'll just give you the value. Um, and then uh, I know in a minute we're going to need an identifier. Uh, and I'll explain why that is in just a moment. Ugh, wow, I should learn how to type identifier. Um, and we're gonna pass property name. Okay, so now we have two things. The property name is, in this case, success. It's just this property. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna show you what we need to build now. So we wanna replace uh, this, these, these arguments. We wanna replace both arguments with a new array of arguments that contains just an error function. But since the error function isn't something we can mutate because it doesn't exist, we have to construct an error function. Um, so we're gonna use uh, the AST types to construct, and JS Code Shift API to construct uh, that arrow function. Um, but I wanted to show you this first, so we actually need to know what this looks like. So uh, when we go to this arguments, so this is, the, this is the, what we actually want, this is the desired output. When we go here and we look at the thing, we can see the, the arguments has an arrow function. That arrow function has an empty params object because it doesn't accept any params. Um, although uh, if, if we wanted to allow params to exist, well in this case it doesn't matter, we don't need that. But we could do whatever we want with the params, but they're gonna be empty in our case and then we need an expression statement with a call expression that contains a member expression, which you can see it highlighting, thing.success, um, and then uh, that is gonna need a name as well. So we're gonna need to name it. Um, so let's build that arrow function. Uh, let arrow function equal. <clears throat> and this is lowercase because we're not doing it inside of the filter function expression. And you know you got it right when it gives you this tab completion. All this stuff is really easily searchable in the, uh, in the code itself, like it's structured very neatly. Um, so in this case, we accept those params. Remember, they're, they're empty. It accepts params, it accepts a body, which is a block statement, and it accepts uh, an expression, which uh, we're not actually going to be giving an expression. So we know we need to give it uh, an empty uh, params uh, array, and then I'm gonna new line, and that's weird that it didn't do the right thing. Uh, and then this is going to be a call expression, because remember, we're just following the call expression here. <clears throat> and that is going to accept something. 
which I want to be kind of syntax highlighted, or not syntax, like indented correctly, so we can actually think about this. Uh, and that accepts a member expression. We can see it over here in j dot lowercase member expression. And then uh, this is going to get uh, node dot uh, arguments zero. I guess I didn't actually make this super clear, but the uh, the argument zero is uh, this, I believe. Um, we're not really changing it, so we want it to stay the same. Okay. All right, member expressions, once again, the type information is happening, or helping us. Uh, we need a type of expression here, which we know that is, uh, and then we need an identifier. Uh, so in this case, the identifier, uh, I should make this actually do the right thing. Um, the identifier, we've already made the identifier as property on line 12 right here. We've already made this because we knew we were gonna need it. Um, and that's lowercase identifier. Uh, and we're gonna say property. And we're gonna close that off. Am I already closed off? Yes, I am. Okay, so it's not exactly the most intuitive editor, by the way. Okay, uh, and then uh, we have, uh, if you recall, the call expression accepts three arguments. So we have, uh, we have to um, give an empty array. And then, am I right? One more parentheses? There we go. Okay. And, uh, and it, oh, it doesn't do the right thing yet. Hold on. There's one more thing, one more step. Inside of the if statement, I need to, uh, this, this is tripping me up. This one is already correct. Sorry, I'll get rid of that. Uh, path.node.arguments. Remember, we, the whole point of this was to replace the arguments, and we're going to just set the arguments to an array uh, that includes our arrow function. And there's your code mod. Okay, I'm gonna switch back over to the, uh, to the presentation, so give me a second. You guys can, uh, I guess, finish up on that exercise. I, I have a, the bit.ly link also has revisions, so it took you to the ASD Explorer. There are revisions. If you got stuck in any spot, you can click the revisions tab and you should be able to see it. I believe it's a, a gist, so just go to the, follow the gist uh, ID and you can see the revisions. Okay, so, uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about, uh, now that you've written a code mod, so uh, just a show of hands, uh, who has done a code mod? Who has, who has actually written one? Hey, there's more hands raised this time than the first time. Um, so writing a code mod like that, uh, I found is a little tedious to do when you have a large project and you wanna like write something really quickly. So I find that it's really good to have collated, co-located co co code mods. Uh, and as a result of that, I wanted to write a project. So uh, I worked on this project with uh, Robert Jackson to, uh, to basically encapsulate some good practices around uh, writing and testing code mods. So a couple of the priorities are that uh, we want to prevent stale documentation. Uh, we want to uh, make testing easy via inputs and outputs, simple inputs and outputs. Oh, and then we want it to be invocable quickly so that you can share it. And then it also needs to be able to take that, uh, that import export thing and we want to copy and paste it into AST Explorer so it has to be in one file. Um, so we wrote uh, this uh, program, you can definitely check it out, uh, rwjblue slash codemodcli. Um, and the way it solves uh, stale documentation is that it creates, uh, it creates automatically creates documentation that includes your inputs and outputs. So if you write a test that says, hey, given this input, this transform will turn it into this output, it will write the input and output in the readme automatically when you run the generate docs command. Uh, and then it also, uh, it just is just testing inputs and outputs. You can actually see an example of CodeMod CLI uh, at Ember QUnit CodeMod. This is to get to the more uh, recent test configuration with setup rendering tests and utilizing hooks for Ember. Um, but it has a really good example of just showing uh, basic inputs and outputs and all of the different transformation levels and you can have as much granularity as you want. And each one of those will have a, an entry in the readme. It will be, uh, there will be a table of contents so you can link to individual transform readmes. Um, so if you have like a, a, a large project and you wanna just keep track of code mods as you go along, this is a really great way to do it. Um, and then uh, it also makes execution of a code mod easier uh, by making it available via like NPX. So any of your transforms can be, uh, could be um, converted in this fashion. So, uh, so let's rejoin our hero. Our hero uh, writes the code mod we just wrote. 
uh, and puts it into code mod CLI and then runs npx my dash code mod convert bad function to good function. That's the name of the transform file. And then gives it a glob of, of transforms and she does it. And then she presents it to her colleagues and everyone's happy and everyone goes off in the sunset and is, and, and is happy. Um, okay, so that's really it. I have some references here. I'm gonna leave this on the slide for about five, 10 seconds. Uh, maybe take a screenshot if you're, if you're curious about this. Um, QUnit code mod is a great example. Uh, Tobias, a lot of the QUnit code mod and code mod CLI stuff came out of Tobias's work and is, is also Simon's work. I don't know where Simon is. Hey. Um, and it's, it's, there's, a, there's a great community of code mods uh, in, in the Ember space and I definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, special thanks to all these people who helped me uh, refine this talk to make it uh, not as daunting to me for me doing live coding and stuff. So uh, thank you. And that's it, thank you. <laughs>